The views and opinions expressed in the following program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of KSMQ Public Service Media Incorporated or its assigns. tonight for the show on biotechnology and agriculture. KSMQ and Farm Connections welcomes you and with me tonight is on my right Linda Meschke from Farm Advantage. She's the founder and president and on my far right George Cummins of Iowa State University at least was up until January 31st when he retired. Right. Welcome tonight. Thank you. We want to talk about biotechnology and to start with Linda what does biotechnology mean to you? Well, biotechnology is about uh, um, plants and animals and uh, some of the uh, growth or the uh, crossing and breeding of those plants, development of new plants, development of new technologies that are bio-based. Um, some of our things like bio-oils or, or fuels are uh, examples of uh, how we've incorporated biotechnology into our, into our lives every day. Thank you. George, you were with Iowa State University and did some things in research and also in biotechnology, and it sounds like you're continuing to follow agriculture. What does biotechnology mean to you? I guess a generic definition would be uh, applying science to the identification and solutions of problems involving living organisms. In our discussion, of course, crop and livestock production, and I think there's also some implications for human health and medicine. Uh, biotechnology has brought in a whole new vocabulary uh, in our, our studies, uh, genetically modified organisms, uh, GMOs uh, has come in, uh, genetic engineering, and that involves uh, uh, gene mapping, uh, identifying the genomes, uh, the mapping of all of traits and that sort of thing in animals and plants and humans, and um, uh, gene splicing, and uh, this has brought uh, tremendous advantages and uh, speeded up uh, crop improvement specifically. Uh, just a couple other terms, um, uh, nutraceuticals is coming in. We can uh, use conventional and uh, gene splicing to produce plants which have specific properties which we like. It might be a particular uh, protein quality. It might be a type of oil that we're looking for. Um, uh, low linolenic oil is, is in the supermarkets right now, uh, supposed to be healthier. Those are examples. Uh, those were with conventional breeding. And then uh, uh, pharmaceuticals, uh, PHAR, which is um, uh, things like uh, human insulin and uh, growth promotants uh, that have been produced by plants rather than uh, traditional animal sources. So that's all. It's an exciting new field. Thank you, George. Linda. I and reading some of your brochures and your website, you talk about the third crop. What is that? Well, we look at third crops as being crops other than corn and soybeans. Okay. So in south central Minnesota where we, uh, we're located and the, and the work that we do is, most of it is in that area, we're looking for other crops that can be planted on the landscape, provide economic return back to the farm families, but yet provide um, water quality benefits to help address some of the water quality issues associated with production agriculture. Does this tie into the Medelia project? Right, with the Medelia project what we're trying to do is uh, demonstrate how a bioenergy facility can be a catalyst or a market for third crops grown on the landscape, mainly perennial plants strategically placed in the landscape that would provide improved water quality, improve um, soil health overall, and um, help increase production on that car on that particular farm and uh, farm economies. Ambitious. Well, we're, tr we're, we're moving in that direction, getting out there. How do preannuals help water quality and help our soil quality? Well, they um, sequester a terrific amount of carbon and also they have a much more extensive root system that helps to build organic matter and minerals in the soil and help improve the health of the soil biology. 
uh, or the bio biological activity in the soils. And so um, um, also they help filter um, sediment that might be moving across the landscape during like a major storm event. And also um, they utilize nitrogen and phosphorus and, and actually some plants like alfalfa, for example, could um, actually mine phosphorus where you have excessive levels in your field. So um, um, take the plant, put it in the landscape in the right position and, and we can have uh, really good benefits from that. And you mentioned phosphorus. Why is that sometimes a problem? Well, in, in Minnesota, we're, of course, blessed with our 10,000 lakes. And um, phosphorus is a limiting factor for um, algae growth in freshwater systems. And so one pound of phosphorus can grow approximately 500 pounds of algae. And so what we want to do is keep that phosphorus up in the landscape, up in the fields, where it can be used for plant production, plant growth, um, grow, you know, raise those uh, kernels of corn or bushels of soybeans and, and not in our lakes growing algae. So um, that's as simple as it gets. Thank you. When you talked about differences between native plants and perennials, I, I think of a, a lawn or a golf course with a very shallow root system, maybe a few inches, versus a perennial which might have several feet. Is that part of it? Right. Well, a lot of your, um, um, well, perennial basically is a plant that lives more than three years before you have to reseed it or replant it. And uh, native perennials have a fairly extensive root system, whereas some of your exotic perennials, such as um, smooth brome grass or um, blue stem, or Kentucky bluegrass, excuse me, mm -hmm. um, that's um, got a really shallow root system. So what we're talking about inches of root system in depth versus many feet of root system. So um, another example uh, is uh, like corn, the root system of the corn, if you collected all that, it's about um, 300 pounds per, I think it's uh, 100 square feet. Whereas if you took a, a perennial system with like switchgrass, for example, it's like 3,000 pounds. So it's like 10 times um, the mass of root and organic material in those root systems. So it's significantly different. Helps create um, or provide resiliency in the crops. And uh, so as we look at times of, of uh, low rainfall, low moisture, um, and the longer term sustainability of, of our crops, um, those are things we should, we should try to look for and support as part of an overall farm system. Thank you. George, you brought some things with you today, a whole toolbox full. Can you tell us a little <laughs> bit about that? Yeah, I think uh, particularly for our urban viewers, uh, kind of bring this uh, into perspective. Uh, we've got a uh, herbicide, uh, probably most of you know it as Roundup. The active ingredient is glyphosate. It's a non-selective, uh, kills most everything green. It's translocated. Um, it's a wonderful weed product and with uh, biotechnology, our corn and soybean breeders have been able to uh, infuse a resistance to this particular herbicide. It's improved weed control dramatically. That's one of the uh, uh, traits which is um, uh, attributable to uh, biotechnology. Uh, the second is uh, Bacillus thuringiensis, Bt. It's an insecticide naturally occurring um, and uh, there's been all kinds of uh, anti franken food kinds of things with, with some of our Bt products. but. This is a naturally occurring insecticide. Uh, this is a, a uh, tomato and um, uh, cabbage worm product insecticide that I've been using for years. Uh, it's also marketed as Dipel, which is used in stored grain. Uh, and uh, what, again, the plant breeders have done is, is infuse strains of Bt that will control corn borers and corn rootworms into our corn plants. Uh, this is a a BT uh, uh, strain that is used to control mosquito larvae. And uh, it's sold over the counter. I got this at a farm fleet store. Uh, you put it in your bird bath, put it in any uh, uh, water that would create a breeding site for mosquitoes. Uh, also, a lot of our public parks and so on are sprayed with BT now, uh, very safe, uh, rather than using a pesticide that uh, might be harmful to us. 
and our kids that are playing in the playgrounds and so on. Uh, how does Bt work? Uh, it is a protein, or the bacteria produces a protein. The protein in an alkaline digestive system forms a physical crystal, which destroys the intestinal tract of tomato worms and corn borers and so on. Uh, in our digestive system and domestic animals and livestock and wildlife, which have an acid system, it's digested as a protein and it's beneficial. So uh, this is some of the technology which we can use and of course the plant breeders, um, uh, the companies that market this trait get a licensing fee for it. Uh, farmers that use these traits and we now have stacked hybrids that have uh, many of these traits in them, uh, they, uh, they pay a tech fee for that privilege of having that trait. And uh, as a result, seed costs, uh, for example, we've got some stacked hybrids that have all these traits in them now that um, are between three and $350 for 50 pounds. So our seed cost may be over, well over $100 an acre for corn, and that may be higher than the fertilizer bill, which has been the, yeah. the major one. So uh, it has been um, readily adopted by farmers. Uh, in Iowa in 2009, uh, just saw the statistics, 57% uh, of the corn fields had contained stacked hybrids that had more than one trait, and something like uh, seven out of eight fields had at least one GMO trait uh, in them. So very quickly adopted by, by farmers. George, you mentioned stacking. Can you, for our audience, just describe stacking of genes and traits? Uh, basically, it would just be more than one of these traits. It would have a herbicide tolerance. It would have uh, maybe insecticide tolerances. Uh, there's different uh, forms of BT, different events, what they call them. And uh, some of our newest uh, hybrids have more than one resist, uh, more, more than one event to control corn borers or corn rootworms, and this is to prevent a resistance building up. Uh, anybody that uh, plants these insecticide traits must sign a contract, like uh, uh, they must have a refuge, 20% of their acreage must be in a non-BT isoline uh, to prevent resistance, and, and we've seen some resistance building up in some of these BT traits already, even though they've only been on the market less than 10 years. George, can you elaborate on the refuge, the 20%, how that actually af affects and helps avoid resistance? Okay. Uh, what we're trying to do is, uh, uh, well, you never kill all the insects. And if uh, an insect gets a small dose, it may survive. And then it breeds. And if you get a uh, well, a recessive trait, uh, it, 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 if a resistant breeds with a resistant, you get a continuing resistance. And so the idea is to prolong the effectiveness of this. With the refuge, uh, there's generally some uh, other control means. It may be a chemical, uh, like in continuous corn for rootworm. They would apply a rootworm insecticide along with that uh, to control any that would be resistant to the BT trade. Thanks. Again, it's, it's a way to protect this technology and prolong its usefulness. You talked about seed cost moving to well in excess of $300 a bag, and of course if a bag does two and a half acres, two and a half to three acres, yeah. depending on the population, that cost could be in excess of 100 and often is. What advantage, why would somebody invest that much in a crop and invest that much in biotechnology. There must be a payback. I guess uh, I would start with, uh, I'm a part-time farmer, and I like weed-free fields being an extension specialist. Uh, Roundup has made me look pretty good. Uh, these kind of non-selective, uh, and I, I kid people that uh, their fields look almost as good as the advertisement for that product. With the case of insecticides, um, the alternative, of course, is to use very dangerous chemicals, chemicals which um, will affect my health, uh, which could leach into water, 
those kinds of things. These are very targeted, so they're safer. Also, I don't have to go out in August and scout and see if they've exceeded the thresholds when I should be spraying or when the damage, when they needs to be controlled. A convenience. I guess the downside socially is that uh, it's allowed farmers to farm more and more acres very efficiently, very effectively. We've, we've um, substituted capital in our investment in seed and reduced our labor commitment and so on and uh, farmers can farm more acres uh, well. And uh, they've, they've, as the adoption rate suggests, they've embraced it. And along with that, as the seed cost has gone up, I think we've seen a parallel drop in herbicide cost. Would, would you agree with that? Uh, well, so I would say we've seen a tremendous drop in insecticide use, which is great. Uh, herbicides, uh, you're paying the tech fee, and of course, um, marketing strategy is uh, you pay the tech fee and then your um, cost of our product will be cheaper than the competition. Uh, there are still some other non-GMO crops being grown. There are still some options as far as uh, herbicides and insecticides that are still available on the market. And uh, of course, we've got some farmers that are organic, non-GMO, and um, they have to depend on other practices. Um, uh, well, integrated crop management, you've got cultural practices like rotations, uh, time of planting, and that type of thing. You've got uh, biological controls, which would be beneficial insects, for example. Uh, we've got mechanical tillage, cultivation for weed control. Um, One of the advantages of these uh, BT or, or other features from these uh, um, products would be less tillage practices or less tillage passes across the Absolutely. field. So if you can put that herbicide or your pesticide on at the time you plant that corn seed, that saves a pass over the field. Also, you maybe would see some yield advantages uh, depending on the, the problem that you have with a particular insecticide but, uh, or insect, but uh, um, you certainly could see a yield bump at, at the end of the season. I think one of the best reasons for uh, adopting no-till, uh, reduced tillage, has been you can get weed control yep. chemically and uh, there's no residue with glyphosate uh, it's not going to leach into the water. It's uh, not a restricted use pesticide because we don't have photosynthesis, we don't have chlorophyll to disrupt. And so, um, for this reason, there's lots of advantages to it. And I think that should make Farm Advantage and Linda happy. Investing in the technology brings down possibly the herbicide use, the fuel used to till, the um, wear and tear on machinery, the labor right. kinds of things. A, a big factor with it is the um, less use of, of chemicals and especially the mm -hmm. insecticides because they tend to be um, most likely to be more detrimental to, to the environment, um, more so than the herbicides. But the herbicides can, can have their disadvantages as well, but uh, Roundup, it, compared to other um, herbicides is, is pretty environmentally safe and uh, a much wiser choice probably than uh, some of the other things that have been used. I would mention that um, one of the concerns is we go to uh, a common weed control system for both corn and beans or continuous corn uh, is that we're developing some resistant weeds to glyphosate to round up. Uh, this year in Iowa, they just identified three weeds in populations, not all of them, but uh, mare's tail, giant ragweed, and water hemp uh, found populations within the state that are resistant. And um, uh, in my previous employment, was one of our jobs in the fall was to go out to soybean fields, uh, pick out water hemp plants that had survived or escaped, uh, collect the seeds, send them to Ames, and they would treat them in the greenhouse with varying levels of the herbicide and some of them are loving it. So they've developed a resistance over time and so we need to develop systems that will counteract that. Mother Nature has a way of adapting and adjusting. Yeah. Sounds like our researchers and uh, scientists have a lot of work to do yet and it will be a continuum. Yes. Would you agree with that? Oh yes, uh, certainly. would also mention that uh, uh, a lot of this is now in private hands. 
the uh, research and development on a lot of these traits. Uh, there was a meeting, a uh, hearing in Ankeny recently that involved the uh, Secretary of Agriculture, Tom Vilsack, uh, the Attorney General, Eric Holder, uh, representatives from a number of the commodity groups, uh, some producers, uh, individual producers talking about the concentration of control of our food systems. And one example would be seed and chemicals. There's three major players, uh, beef packing, um, integrated swine and poultry operations. It's uh, creating some social concerns for the viability of rural communities. Thank you, George. You brought a couple of books along. Can you expand, especially on that top one, Star for Science? Um, I, I guess I'd start with the bottom one. That's just fine. <laughs> um, there's uh, Norman Borlaug, Minnesota and Iowa's Gift to the World, uh, was involved in conventional breeding techniques. And uh, uh, there's a couple volumes out uh, that describe the effort that it took for him to develop the miracle wheats and his team and so on. And uh, his concern is that uh, we feed the world. And uh, the Green Revolution uh, converted some countries from basket cases into exporters in a very short time mm -hmm. because of a package of improved genetics and fertilizer and credit and markets and so on. Um, the Green Revolution hasn't hit Africa yet. And the technology is there. Um, this book is why biotechnology has been kept away from or kept out of these countries. And uh, a lot of it's political. And a lot of it is the fact that uh, uh, these are con the, the technology comes from developed countries. Uh, we, who are well fed, are making decisions that affect people who could use the technology. One concern about uh, the biotechnology is that uh, these tech fees and so on, many of the farmers in developing countries keep their own seed. And um, uh, if you have to buy seed each year, uh, maybe this is a cash cost that could not be covered uh, by those people. So that's what the book's about. Uh, it, it's hard to give a quick synopsis on here, but um, uh, if that's of interest to you, uh, these are books that I'd recommend. Um, there's some other books, uh, Mendel in the Kitchen, uh, by an author named Dworkin, uh, which talks about biotechnology and, and um, again, uh, it's a, more of a college text, uh, big words that I don't even understand. And then um, a gentleman named Wietmeyer has written two volumes on Borlaug hmm. and uh, is coming out with a third and fourth as time permits. And uh, these are available through Amazon and-, and uh, uh, Possibly the public library. Public library. Uh, I know that um, the World Food Prize, which is held each October, uh, he's given copies to all the Iowa legislators of okay. his books. And also um, uh, he's offered them to high schools to use as a reference and maybe in community colleges uh, that would be a possibility too to, to study Excellent. about this great man. There's certainly uh, University of Minnesota connections uh, continue to be. Thanks. I guess the one theme that uh, keeps coming out in here is uh, Borlaug credits um, farmer involvement in his research, uh, public support for research, and a strong extension service for his success. And uh, in the last 10, 15 years, uh, with the introduction of a lot of these protected traits, uh, the support for public research has declined. Mm -hmm. And um, of course, in the news every day, uh, there's uh, talk about budget reductions in the major universities, whether it's Minnesota or Iowa or whatever. And um, uh, the question is, who's going to do the research? And a lot of the research grants and so on are very targeted. And it may not be what needs to be done, but it's what the money's available. So that's the way you, you keep your people employed. George, if we go to a hungry place, their answer might be different than an affluent, well-fed place. And your book, Star for Science, leads me to think about a trip I took to South Africa. We toured the uh, 
Fair Trade Training Center in South Africa. Uh -huh. And uh, when asked, the director said, when the director was asked about what do you think of biotechnology, she said, we need it to save and to feed our people. And on the screen is a picture of uh, a Riverland hat being given to one of the workers there. And then soon I think there'll be a picture up showing uh, what happens when poverty is rampant. It's a shanty town in South Africa. I'll let you use your imagination about what's flowing down the middle, kind of a brown color. But her concern was how do we feed people without biotechnology? And you have been wonderful gifts. You've caused us to think some. We've got about one minute left. Linda, anything in summary? Well, just say that um, you know a lot of the biotechnology, one of the great advantages is, is yield increases. And uh, Borlaug certainly was the the king of that and uh, getting that going and and so you know we've all benefited from that and it's great that we can share it with other countries and and more countries as as we're able. Linda if we want to find out more about Farm Advantage what's the website please? The website is um, www.ruraladvantage r-u-r-a-l-a-d-v-a-n-t-a-g-e dot org. Thank you Rural Advantage. Linda Metzke, the founder and president of Rural Advantage. George, thank you for joining us again. Any final closing comments? I guess it'd just be a disclaimer now that I don't work for Iowa State that uh, any opinions expressed are my own. And <laughs> Fair enough. If you don't agree with me, why, you know, you don't need to write the Board of Regents or President of Iowa State University, uh, get a hold of me. Fair enough. George Cummins, Linda Metzke, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. For more information, log on to ksmq.org and click on Farm Connections. There you can find past episodes and participate with the blogs where you can submit your ideas or questions. Tune in next time as we continue to discuss the impacts of agriculture on all of us. For everyone at Farm Connections, I'm Dan Hoffman, thanking you for joining us. See you next week. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you.